What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat BDGE Fantasy Football. I am Nicholas. We're getting into some must own wide receivers today, building off of Monday's video, which was the must own running backs. If you missed that, go check it out. I will link in the description. I know running backs are exciting. I know wide receivers can get kind of boring. No one wants to start their draft off with wide receivers, but it's really nice to have some stud wide receivers. It's nice to hit on those guys in rounds two, three, four, five, and have steady production week over week, PPR leagues, half PPR leagues, whatever you play in, wide receivers still play a very, very, very pivotal role. So we're going to break them down here at the HQ. You know, it's been a surgical summer already and nothing is stopping in the doctor's office. So tuck your shirts in, stop yelling, enjoy the video. Also, real quick, tomorrow, if you're watching this Wednesday, tomorrow on Thursday, August 1st, I will be heading into the Fantasy Sports Network studio in Manhattan. They do a 24-7 live radio show, but for their show from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time, I will be joining them in studio, friend of the show, Frank Stample. I actually haven't met him in real life yet, but I'm excited to get in there. We're going to talk fantasy for two hours from 2 to 4 p.m. I'm going to try to live stream it on my YouTube channel. I don't know if they're going to let me do that in their studio, but if they do, 2 o'clock to four o'clock tomorrow. If not, I will try to find the information for this Fantasy Sports Network radio station and link that down below so you could follow along. Just wanted to put that little announcement in there before the video starts and back to your regularly scheduled programming. Enjoy. If you find yourself at any point throughout the video being like, damn, that was very informational. That was very factual, dropping the big facts on you and you're enjoying the video. All I ask is that you hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Before we start, I want to ask you guys who are some of your must-own wide receivers this year. Prior to me jumping into my guys, I'd like to hear what your guys' thoughts are. So drop, you know, one, two, three, 17 names that you are going to be targeting in all of your fantasy football drafts this year. Some big facts behind it. Just give me a quick reason why. I don't want to just hear a bunch of names because that doesn't help anybody out there. Help me help you. Drop your must own wide receivers down below in the comment section. Hit that thumbs up button while you're down there. First guy up on this list. Well, you know what? I would put Devontae Adams up on this list, but not everyone's going to have a chance to draft him. After the big four running backs go off the board, Devontae Adams is my number one target in all of my fantasy football leagues. If he is on the board and all those running backs are gone, without hesitation, we're hitting that cop button. I don't want to break him down though again because not everybody can get him. He's going to end up scoring 17 or 18 touchdowns this year and smashing records. Devontae Adams, make sure he is on your team. But for real, the first guy up on this list is Juju Smith-Schuster of the Pittsburgh Steelers. This is the second consecutive year that Juju, the god, has found himself on my must-own wide receiver list. I do this list, a big list, 10 rounds, round by round in my draft guide, which is on bigdogsdraftguide.com. He was my must-own player for, I believe he was a fourth round or fifth round pick last year. Whatever it was, Juju was on there, deservedly so. He makes it back onto the list this year. He is a second rounder. He was the number two wideout for the rece- uh, for the Steelers last year, right? Behind Antonio Brown, finished the season with 1,426 receiving yards, seven touchdowns, 111 receptions at the age of 21. At the age of 21. Hear that loud and clearly. But yeah, yeah, he's getting old and this is he's going to drop off. He's going to do worse than he did last year. Usually once you hit 21, things start going downhill. The public would say something like, Oh, but now he gets double coverage because Antonio Brown is gone. And he can't handle that. Then I would go ahead and show you splits. The three games that we've seen from Juju in which Antonio Brown has been off the field. His numbers are better with Antonio Brown off the field. His individual game lines without Antonio Brown. It was week 17 last year. It was weeks 16 and 17 in 2017. 10 targets, 5 receptions, 37 yards, and a touchdown. 7 targets, 6 receptions, 75 yards, and a touchdown. 10 targets, 9 receptions, 143 yards, and a touchdown. The public would then say, yeah, well, obviously he's going to get more volume with Antonio Brown off the field. We look at Juju Smith-Schuster as a player. He's played in 30 career games through two seasons so far. Despite being labeled as a slot wide receiver, there have been 13 instances or 43% of his games in which he has actually played more snaps out wide than he has in the slot, which is showcased in the second row of the chart that is now on your screen. Juju has played more snaps in the slot than outside in 17 of 30 games, right? So while he is definitely a primary slot receiver, it's not exclusive whatsoever. Again, 43% of his games so far in his career 
have had more outside snaps than inside snaps. So not an exclusive slot wide receiver. And as you can see with Antonio Brown sideline, right? There was a three games in which Antonio Brown did not play, which I already told you the stat lines. Juju played more outside snaps in all three games and averaged a career best split 17.8 half PPR points per game. It's absolutely a very small sample size, but it just shows that people who say he can't do it without Antonio Brown literally did zero research because the games would show you otherwise. Also, the fake narrative news of him getting double teamed, that happens at such a low rate in the NFL. You, you can't cover one guy with two cornerbacks. You just don't, you don't play that way. That never happens. Like at, at the very, very most, a guy might get double coverage on like 6% of his routes. That's not a concern for Juju this year. Yes, there might be an extra safety over the top. That could be a double team thing. That's where Antonio Brown won, though. That's not where Juju Smith-Schuster wins his routes. He doesn't. He's not a speedster. He doesn't beat you downfield. He is a yak machine. He is ranked inside the top two in yards after the catch in all NFL wide receiver rankings over the last two years consecutively. Quick hits, strong hands, yards after the catch. Again and again and again and again. 111 times last year to be exact. So Antonio Brown obviously gone. A ton of targets up for grabs in this offense. The better argument I could say here, not that Antonio Brown is leaving and Juju is going to struggle to be the wide receiver one here, is that maybe this passing offense takes a little bit of a dip in volume. But Juju last year saw 24% of the team's targets. This year, that's going to jump up to 27, 28, 29%, around where the elite wide receiver ones in their respective offenses tend to see that type of volume target. Even if Pittsburgh's volume overall as a passing offense goes down because they led the league in pass attempts, Ben Roethlisberger did, which it's definitely going to happen. It'll probably drop from around 680 to 600, 615, 620, because that's where they're normally at. If Juju's percentage of the targets increases, which it undoubtedly will, even if it's a slight tick, even if it goes from 24 to 26 or 27, his volume is still very, 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 very much going to be there. He had 166 targets last year, as we already said. AB gone, 169 targets up for grabs. I'm not saying all of these targets are going to go to Juju. I would say that basically puts him as a lock for 170 targets. We went back over the last five seasons. There have been 10 different instances. So on average, two wide receivers have finished with 170 targets in a season. Demarius Thomas was the only one out of these 10 wide receivers, not to finish as a top four fantasy wide receiver. Eight out of 10 were the wide receiver three or better. A handful of them were the wide receiver overall one in fantasy. I think there's a very, very, very legitimate chance that Juju, just by pure volume, is going to be the wide receiver two or better in fantasy football this year. Do I think he's as raw uh, of an athlete and as a talent as the guys up top like Odell, DeAndre Hopkins, Julio Jones? Absolutely not. But he's in a situation where the passing volume is extremely high. He already saw a ridiculous volume last year in his 21-year-old season, guys. That's the thing. Like, fantasy football doesn't have to be that hard. Sometimes guys are just really, really damn good at football. When you try to surpass that and you try to get too into the numbers and try to convince yourself all this other nonsense, that's where you start fucking up. I'm telling you, don't fuck up on Juju Smith-Schuster because he is, again, hashtag really, 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 really good at football. The Steelers' top dog, Juju, wins all facets of the field and all facets of the game. He was top 10 in air yards. So yes, he runs a lot of his routes from the slot, but he also gets a lot of deep passes. Air yard market share, he was also top 10. Receptions of 20 plus and 40 plus yards, he was also top 10. So he gets the deep looks, he gets a lot of slot looks, he gets overall volume, 111 catches last year, guys. That is so valuable. And it's being overlooked because there was eight wide receivers, I believe, or eight overall players with tight ends included that went over the 100 yard reception mark. But in a normal year, if Juju were to catch 111 balls, he would be arguably the number one PPR wide receiver in fantasy football. So with the volume that we're expecting, his volume floor is so damn high. And I, you can't underestimate that. But when you also look at how involved he is in this offense overall, that's where I get excited. Because he scored seven touchdowns his rookie year and then seven touchdowns again last year on double the amount of targets. I think he's going to be closer to the touchdown rate that he had his rookie year than he had last year, right? He had the second most red zone targets in the entire NFL behind only Devontae Adams last year. And that was while Antonio Brown had a ton of red zone targets as well. So him gone opens up even more volume for him to be had down there, or at least repeat those numbers. So if you thought it was going to be regression, maybe that becomes his floor. Maybe that he's solidly within the top three or five guys in terms of red zone targets for the 2019 season. And that makes sense, right? Him getting so many looks down there because he had the 11th best contested catch rate in 2018 after having the third highest contested catch rate in 2017 because when you're in the red zone quarterbacks want to trust a guy that they know can make plays in a very tight area very tight zone because that's what the red zone and the 10 zone are 
the defenses, you can't really spread the defense out and beat them with speed or beat them with separation. You need to be very quick on your feet. You need to be able to create separation within a really small area of the field. And then when the catches get really tight, you need to be able to hold on to those. And that's how you build trust with Big Ben. And that's exactly what Juju did over the last couple of years, right? So Juju scored seven times last year, 4.2% touchdown rate. It was almost double the year prior to that. Why? Because he was tackled on the two yard line five separate times last year. Five. If three of those turned into touchdown instead of getting tackled on the two yard line, we're looking at a double digit touchdown season. And I think Juju is clearly within the top three or four fantasy wide receivers being drafted. For those of you guys, again, like that are saying that Antonio Brown is gone is going to make it a nightmare for Juju. We've seen him on the outside. We've seen him in the slot. The volume is just too damn high and his touchdown reception rate is going to go back up this year. Don't think too hard about it. Juju Smith-Schuster is an easy, easy, easy cop in the second round. Preseason football starts tomorrow. Denver versus Atlanta, and I cannot wait. Big Dogs has partnered up with a new website, monkeyknifefight.com. They have player prop games. Beautiful for fantasy football players, right? We love player analysis. We love player statistics. And that's exactly what Monkey Knife Fight allows you to do. Once the preseason, I think the preseason is a fantastic time to hammer DFS if you play on DraftKings or FanDuel. But these player prop games on Monkey Knife Fight are going to be ideal for making money. We'll put it that way. Because I'm so in tune with what's going on throughout the preseason and watching snap counts and watching trends that are going on. But I think I can help you all out a lot. And and we're going to be doing a lot of player prop games throughout the summer, throughout the preseason. So go sign up on monkeyknifefight.com. If you use my promo code BDGE, they will give you a 100% deposit match. If you want to play with 20 bucks, throw 20 bucks in there, use the promo code BDGE. They will give you an extra 20 bucks. We will together pay the mortgage this preseason with the player prop games that I will be putting out frequently on throughout my videos. And for those of y'all that are new, welcome to the channel, by the way. We're putting out five videos a week, every single week, as well as a bi-weekly private live stream for my Patreon members on patreon.com slash BDGE. So if you have any personal questions, whether they're trade, sit starts, draft questions, margarita questions, how to make a beautiful iced coffee like this one, questions, that is where you can get them. That is where you can ask me, and I will do my best to answer any and all Patron questions, patreon.com slash BDGE. Let's get into the second wide receiver I think is a must-draft wide receiver, Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks continually goes in the fourth round of drafts. This fourth round is littered. If you don't get, you know, what's going to happen is the fourth round was filled with a lot of really good running backs. It was filled with the Marlon Max. It was filled with Aaron Jones. It was filled with Kerryon Johnson a month ago. None of them are going to be fourth round picks when it comes to your actual draft at the end of August. The hype, the hype is going to be too high. We have Theo Riddick getting cut. We have Jamal Williams already hurt. And Aaron Jones looking like a beast. And we have Marlon Mack, who I just literally can't stop hyping up. So none of those guys will be third, uh, fourth round picks. So the fourth round is exclusively saved for wide receivers. And I have a few of them. We're going to dive really deep into three. We already did Juju. We're going to do two more guys. And then at the end of the video, we're going to do some honorable mentions. But Brandon Cooks in the fourth round, like, okay, wide receiver 13, wide receiver 12, wide receiver eight, wide receiver 14. Those are Brandon Cook's fantasy finishes over the last four seasons. 13, 12, 8, 14. He's currently the 16th wide receiver being taken off the board. And I've probably showed you guys this fact more than once. Brandon Cooks has one less 1,100 yard season than Keenan Allen, Stefan Diggs, Amari Cooper, Kenny Galladay, Julian Edelman, Doug Baldwin, Corey Davis, Tyler Lockett combined. And this is more from a dynasty standpoint, but Cooks is two months older, two months older than Kenny G and Stephon Diggs. And Cooks has four career 1100 yard seasons. Them two have zero combined. This is the facts. Cooks is arguably the most underrated, non elite, you know, prototypical wide receiver in football today, in fantasy football today, probably. So why is he getting picked at wide receiver 16 when over the last four seasons he was at worst the wide receiver 14? And I've heard com- people complain about. Brandon Cooks' consistency, and I get why people would get that notion, because when you think of Cooks, you think of speed. When you think of speed, you think of deep balls, and when you think of deep balls, you think of boomer bust kind of players. Thus, the fall in his ADP. Last year, Cooks had two bad games. It was at Denver, and it was at Chicago, so it wasn't really that difficult to figure it out, and it's because Goff was awful in those, man. Goff could not play on the road in tough environments and tough situations. Outside of those two games, sure, Cooks wasn't necessarily elite week over week, but he scored double-digit fantasy points in nine of 15 games, so 60% of the games that he played in double-digit fantasy points, including five separate games of 19 or more fantasy points. 
half PPR. The remaining four were between 7.7 .7 and 9.8 fantasy points, so not exactly weak killers. At wide receiver 16, you're not going to find a guy in a draft that doesn't have at least a handful of bad games, right? When you're in the fourth or fifth round wide receivers, all of them have some kind of risk associated with it. All of them have some kind of inconsistency. All of them have some kind of injury prone label or something, right? There's something off about them if they're in the fourth or fifth round. With Cooks, he's a guy that's done it so often already in his career, and he's still so young. You're not banking on hypothetical upside. The guy has gone for 1,100 total yards in four straight seasons, including coming off of a career year in 2018. 80 receptions, 1,204 receiving yards. Low-key, one of the best parts is that he only finished with five receiving touchdowns, and I think that is bound for positive regression in 2019 based on his volume and based on his eight touchdowns per season average over the last three years. So it was eight, 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 not necessarily, but average wise, eight, eight, eight. And then last year it dipped to five. If he had eight last year, you'd be looking at him as an early third round pick. And you might think Cooper Cup coming back, right? We, we, we've we talked to Dr. Morse about Cooper Cup's injury for a while. Cooper Cup had the ACL tear in week 11. So he had surgery late in the season. Do I think he's going to be back at full health by the time the season starts? No. I know the reports are that he avoided the pup list. That I, I talked to Dr. Morse and he said that doesn't necessarily mean that he's higher on him. We have to see if he's mentally there and physically there. But all signs point to Cup, you know, being ahead of recovery. And it's possible that obviously people, guys are ahead of recovery. Not everyone falls into that 11th, 12th month timetable return on ACL, but we have a very good idea of science and its timetable. People take injuries out of context all the time in fantasy football. Just because a beat reporter said that a guy looked healthy has zero fucking inclination on how healthy they actually are. So either way, if Cup is back, look at Brandon Cooks's per game numbers with Cup in the lineup versus without Cup in the lineup. He was on fucking fire with Cooper Cup in the lineup last year. 8.8 .8 targets per game. He averaged more volume with Cup in the lineup. Seven receptions, 115 yards from scrimmage, and a touchdown every other game. 18 half PPR fantasy points per game with Cup on the field. The Rams superstar, yes, Brandon Cook superstar, 25 years old. And we know his floor. We know his floor, which is quite high. But at the age of 25, 26, are we sure that we've seen his ceiling? I would argue that we do not. The age apex for wide receivers usually starts around 24 or 25 and lasts till 29. So what if he gets incrementally better every year up until like 28? We still have three years of improvement if that's the case. I don't think we've seen him top out. I do not think we have. This could very well be uh, an, another big year statistically for Cooks. What if he takes a 100 yard from scrimmage leap up? You're looking at 1,300 yards. You're looking at 85 receptions, right? In an offense that's poised to continue um, its domination with McVay, extended. He's still going to lead this team. Gurley's knee unlikely to hold up for the entire season. I think they're going to be a much more pass heavy offense. This is going to be an aerial assault led by Brandon Cooks. He is the alpha there. I don't, don't at me, please. The best part about Cooks, Cooks's price is that he'll be your wide receiver two in round four, possibly your wide receiver three. If you go running back early on, if you're like a top four pick, you go running back with, you know, you go like Zeke or Kamara or whatever, and then you nail three wide receivers back to back to back and Cooks is your wide receiver three. Woo! You are going to be sitting Ritty. Things are going to be beautiful, beautiful there. If Cup is out, that just means more volume for Cook. While he's in, he's still very good. While he's out, that's just more volume. And I think there's a possibility Cooper Cup is not really 100% until week six, seven, eight into the season. I think it's going to be the Woods and Brandon Cook show in 2019. That being said, though, if you're in the beginning of the fourth round, I think Cooks is a great pick. If he goes off the board and you can get Robert Woods at the end of the fourth, I think both of them are phenomenal picks. Like I said, I think it's going to be the Woods and Cook show in 2019. I will not be buying Cup anywhere near his fifth, sixth round ADP price. I would much rather own the other two for fourth round picks. Basically, the must own is Brandon Cook's early fourth or Robert Woods end of fourth round. Let's move on to our third wide receiver. If you are enjoying the video thus far, though, all I ask is that you hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Listening via the podcast, subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And a rating and review would be phenomenal. If you want all of my must-own players or my top sleepers, busts, must-draft players, all that kind of shit, bigdogsdraftguide.com is where you'll get them. Everything you need for prepping for your 2019 fantasy football drafts are in there. My rankings, positional rankings, updated daily weekly, whatever. As soon as things need to be updated, they are updated. It's available on your phone, on your laptop, on your tablet. doesn't matter. Anything that you bring to your draft, you can find the draft guide on bigdogsdraftguide.com. 
tons of exclusive articles. Tomorrow is the dropping of the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Bible. It's like a fucking 5,000 word essay. Exactly how to attack your fantasy football draft this year, position by position. I've been watching all the trends that happened over the last like four or five months. That is just a, a monster piece on how I see things playing out this year in fantasy and how I think you should attack your draft. So go cop that now, bigdogsdraftguide.com. Let's get into the third must draft wide receiver. My guy, Tyler Boyd, Cincinnati Bengals, baby. Boyd is currently a sixth or seventh round pick per ADP. I'm not sure how much the AJ Green news about his foot is going to boost him up, but whatever it is, it's probably not high enough. You can go all the way back to the first video I put out this offseason, top wide receiver sleepers for next year. This was very early on before any of these guys got a ton of hype. You could see Tyler Boyd's little beautiful orange head there. February 19th, Tyler Boyd was there. My love for Boyd has gone nowhere. If you've been following the big dogs now for a while, you knew I wanted zero part of AJ Green for the last four months. I was telling y'all to avoid him. He was the easiest value trap ever. While everyone was touting, oh, he's such a good fucking value in third round. They don't take science into fucking analysis and understand that guy's old and he's got tons of foot problems. He ends up tearing ligaments in his foot. I understand it was the op. Listen, before we even get into this, this is why I wore the shirt. I wore the shirt specifically for people that are about to say, well, Tyler Boyd was actually worse when AJ Green was off the field last year. So that's not a good shirt of the fucker. We're going to break down every devil's advocate piece that you could possibly have about Tyler Boyd. There will be no Tyler Boyd blasphemy in the HQ. Understood? I'm sorry I'm always yelling at you. I'm really not in a bad mood. I'm just from New Jersey, so I talk with my hands and I yell a lot. We hated AJ Green. He tears some ligaments in his foot in training camp the other day. He will be sidelined six to eight weeks. My guess is that there's a very good chance he just starts on the pup list and we don't even see him till week six. Maybe he comes back around week three. For those of y'all that are trying to be optimistic about that, I cannot stress to you enough that he needs to be off your redraft boards, almost to the point, off of if, if it's a single digit rounds, do not draft AJ Green. Do yourself a favor. If you are going to say something opposite of what I just said, don't bother leaving a comment because I don't need that kind of negative stress or energy in my life right now. I'm very busy today and I can't be getting pissed off about people thinking AJ Green is still a good pick. He was a horrible pick prior to the injury. It's a really bad pick outside of double digit rounds. Do not draft AJ Green. Something I always say, don't find injuries in fantasy football. They will find you. If you are taking AJ Green, you are literally finding an injury. You are picking an injury waiting to happen. So don't do that. This leads us to somewhat of a shit show in Cincinnati in terms of their offense, though. John Ross just pulled a hamstring. He's going to be sidelined for a couple weeks. It is full on the Tyler Boyd show in Cincinnati, and deservedly so. And the Bengals knew that. They signed him to an extension last week, four years, $43 million. Congrats to Mr. Boyd. He will be eating for a long time, as will his children and them children's after them. And I know y'all are going to get cute. Like I said, AJ Green actually made Tyler Boyd better when he was on the field. Great research, guys. Like, yes, we've all seen the splits by now. He was better last year, specifically when AJ Green was on the field. But what looking at these splits doesn't do is put anything into context. So that is what I am here to do. I'm here to help you understand that context is the most important part about analyzing fantasy football. So, A.J. Green was on the field from weeks 1 to 8. Over that span, Tyler Boyd was the wide receiver 12 in PPR leagues in fantasy football. He was the wide receiver 14 in half PPR leagues. So, he was a legitimate borderline wide receiver 1 last year from weeks 1 to 8 when Green was on the field. He misses weeks 10, 11, 12. They added a bye in week 9. He comes back in week 13, re-injures himself after seeing just one target in the game. So, he barely even played in that game. What people don't want to acknowledge or people are just too lazy or just don't understand and just want to take that one game split and just throw it at every piece of analysis you could see, is that Andy Dalton also missed a very large portion of the end of the season. He played from weeks 1 to 12, got hurt, and missed weeks 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. So what we literally have is a three-game sample size of Boyd without A.J. Green, but with Andy Dalton, and not Jeff Driscoll at quarterback. Context, people. Context. Those three games. Tyler Boyd stat lines. Three receptions, 65 yards. 11 targets, 4 receptions, 71 yards. 8 targets, 7 receptions, 85 yards, and a touchdown. Those are great numbers for Boyd. 8 targets a game. For where you're going to be able to get him in drafts, those kind of numbers are fantastic. 75 yards receiving per game, 8 targets per game. And also what that initial split does not take into account because it's just a machine, right? Rotoviz Game Splits app is a machine. And as soon as, if AJ Green was on the field at all, it will take that into account and put it on the split for him being on the field. 
In week 13, like I said, Green had one target, so he basically did not play at all. He got hurt early. Six receptions, 97 yards on eight targets. So if the split apps actually put that game into the calculations for Green not being on the field, it would be less skewed. So yes, when we get down to it, we have a basically two game sample size that tells us, yes, Tyler Boyd is actually worse when Jeff Driscoll is at quarterback and AJ Green is not on the field. That makes sense. In those three games though, without AJ Green and with Andy Dalton playing quarterback, Boyd saw nearly 30% of the offensive targets. Give me volume over efficiency when you're looking at a small, small, tiny sample size all day. So throw that shitty context list argument out the window, please, because Tyler Boyd's a monster. Nevertheless, here we are. What else do we have about Boyd? What other arguments you guys have? He can't be a true number one. He's not ready to be a number one wide receiver in NFL offense. Boyd graded out last year as PFF's number 11 overall wide receiver on the season. AJ Green was number 12. From weeks 9 to 17, specifically when AJ Green was off the field, Boyd was still a top 14 graded out wide receiver. He didn't get any worse. He had the eighth highest quarterback rating when targeted amongst all NFL wide receivers last year. But he can't be a number one because he's a slot guy. Sure. But the way the NFL is going, if you actually believe that, then you're looking at the wrong thing. Him running from the slot gives you a fantastic PPR floor because you're getting targets with those short passes. You become the safety blanket, the safety valve in this offense. But he also has plenty of monster games on his resume. He went over 130 receiving yards multiple times last year. So he doesn't just give you like six for 75 at what his normal games are. He has games where he goes eight for 130, seven for 135 and a touchdown. So the ceiling is there. He was tied for the third highest catch rate on deep balls last year in the entire NFL. Tyler Lockett, Corey Davis, Tyler Boyd tied with Keenan Allen and Michael Thomas. So yes, he excels on short routes and in the slot, but he's also very good at catching deep passes. And if you think about the NFL today, look at the slot. The bigger slot wide receivers are the ones that are absolutely prospering, right? We already talked about Juju Smith-Schuster, but we have Adam Thielen. We have Cooper Cup. They all fit this same mold. 6'1", 6'2". They are long, about the same weight. Juju's a little bit bigger. They all kind of fit into the same mold. And you look at their 40-yard dash times. None of them are extremely high-level athletes, but they're all really, really good in the slot, right? 4'5", 8", 4'5", 4'5", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 4'6", 
and you know be a real wide receiver one. I love Christian Kirk. Y'all already know that, but I think the ADP is starting to get really, really, really high. So I'm not going to say he's a must draft in the sixth round. When he was in the eighth, man, I miss, I miss ninth round Christian Kirk. I want the old Christian Kirk back, but he's gone. So sixth round, I'll own some shares of him, but I'm not targeting him in every single league. Marquez Valdez-Scantling in Green Bay. He is such a good fit to play the outside there. All of the reports so far is just that he's absolutely dominating camp straight from Aaron Rodgers' mouth. He's like, he's a full-time player. We need him on the field. MVS over Jerron Miles all day. Rodgers targets the outside wide receivers more than he does the slot wide receivers. Him and Devontae Adams are going to eat this year. Absolutely love Marquez Valdez-Scantling. For sub 4 four forty, he's got the speed. Aaron Rodgers' touchdown rate is going to go back up. He's going to throw probably 35 to 40 touchdowns this year. And I think like eight of them end up being to Marquez Valdez-Scantling. He's also a great deep threat. So look for long plays, look for touchdown plays. All in on MBS this year. Kiki QT, another guy who is behind Will Fuller technically, but Will Fuller also suffered that ACL tear mid to late in the season. I don't think he's going to be at 100% until we're into the season, which means Kiki QT, who also had a bunch of phenomenal game lines last year, is going to be a a much higher volume player than a lot of people are projecting him out to be. So I love QT at the end, you know, ninth, 10th, 11th round. Deshaun Jackson, um, he's been someone, he's probably one of my most highly owned wide receivers in best ball drafts. He's always been. I just think the connection between him and Wentz is going to be fruitful. There's new reports coming out of Philly's camp every single day about how good Deshaun Jackson and Wentz's connection looks like. I think Deshaun Jackson has a realistic chance to top 1,100 receiving yards, eight or nine touchdowns, a bunch on deep plays. So um, if Deshaun Jackson can escape this preseason without like pulling a hamstring or something, I will be all in on the newly acquired. I wouldn't be surprised if he outproduces every other wide receiver there, including Alshon Jeffrey. So give me Deshaun Jackson in the 10th or 11th round over Jeffrey in the 6th or 7th round all day long. Those are my must own wide receivers for the 2019 fantasy football season. Thumbs up. Comment down below who you love. If you agree or disagree with the guys on my list, go cop the bigdogdraftguide.com, which has all of, if you thought this shit was in-depth, you will absolutely love the draft guide. It's everything you need for your 2019 fantasy football season. I'll see y'all tomorrow on Fade the Public, where we did Parade It or Fade It, one of my favorite segments to do. That's all I got. I love you. MonkeyKnifeFight.com, promo code BDGE when you sign up. 100% deposit match. Bye.